To enable the potential of human capacity, one must be able to imagine the ideal and create what is realized. Since the existence of man, the transition from the multidisciplinary to the specialist has been imminent. A breakthrough in this convention is stemmed by a man whose passion allows him to delve into multidisciplinary fields while having the fundamental knowledge of a specialist. This breed of man originated in the period of the Renaissance through the embodiment of Leonardo da Vinci. Arguably, Leonardo da Vinci was the first and only Renaissance man to have ever lived. The thralls of the present-day education system motivate individuals to pursue interests based on the dominant side of their brain. Filtering intellectuals to favor the left side of their brain limits them to critical thinking, numbers, and reasoning, while the right limits them to intuition, ingenuity, and creativity. This is the reason why it is common to have engineers lacking creativity and artists lacking practicality in the present world. In the past 500 years, left and right brain specialists have flourished and thrived, dominating the working world as we know it. Nonetheless, no apparent Renaissance man has existed since the time of Leonardo da Vinci. In this presentation, we will explore the revered Leonardo and how he came to embody the Renaissance man. Leonardo da Vinci was born out of wedlock on April 15, 1452 in the Tuscan hill town of Vinci to a wealthy legal notary, Piero da Vinci, and a peasant woman, Caterina. Through adolescence, Leonardo was fixated by nature, water, and the phenomenon of flight. At the age of 14, he was apprenticed to artist Andrea del Verrocchio. Verrocchio was a goldsmith by trade who eventually became renowned for his sculpting and painting. Through the multidisciplinary efforts of Verrocchio, Leonardo was exposed to many technical skills, such as drafting, chemistry, metallurgy, metalworking, plaster casting, leatherworking, mechanics, and carpentry, as well as the artistic skills of drawing, painting, sculpting, and modeling. Leonardo da Vinci is defined as a perfectionist and a master procrastinator. Throughout his life, Leonardo worked on numerous projects and commissions, which he often either did not finish or destroyed. Leonardo da Vinci began his career as an artist at the age of 14 when he was sent to Florence to work as an apprentice to Verrocchio, a famous artist at the time. Later on, during his apprenticeship, he was given the opportunity to paint an angel holding the robe of Jesus in Verrocchio's painting, The Baptism of Christ. As you can see in the painting, there is a dramatic difference in the quality of Leonardo's angel and Verrocchio's work. It has been said that Verrocchio never painted again after completing the Baptism of Christ, due to Leonardo's skills. Other pieces of art that Leonardo never completed include the Adoration of the Magi and the famous Bronze Horse. It took Leonardo approximately 16 years just to finish the clay pre-model of the Bronze Horse. Although Leonardo studied for pouring on a large scale by talking to cannon and bell makers, and also casters of bronze in Milan, he was never able to complete the bronze horse due to political instability in Milan. Later, after the French invaded Milan, they used the clay model of the horse as a target practice and completely destroyed the horse. Another very famous painting of Leonardo da Vinci is the Mona Lisa. According to records, Leonardo took 10 years to work on Mona Lisa's lips, which is another example of Leonardo's perfectionist personality. Due to Leonardo's perfectionism, he worked on the Mona Lisa until he died, and although the Mona Lisa is not completed work of Leonardo, it carries a depth and expression that encompassed all of Leonardo's work. Leonardo was characterized to be a man of very high caliber, and of a very gentle and loving nature. The main characteristics of Leonardo's artwork that set him aside from other artists of his time was his ability to create art that contained expression, movement, and realism as compared to the static figures of his counterparts. Since childhood, Leonardo was a vegetarian, and most specialists considered his choice of lifestyle an indication for his love of living creatures. This combined with his curiosity allowed him to venture into the field of science and create another famous drawing, the Vitruvian Man. 
It is apparent that Leonardo used to combine both art and science in his work. By studying science, he was better able to conceptualize his environment and was able to achieve a form of art that captured the realism of the world. Due to the depth and detail of his work, many people speculate that Leonardo started from the bones outward. Leonardo was notoriously unreliable at completing commissioned work. He spent a huge amount of time figuring out the problems related to the content and composition, but would get bored during the act of creating the work itself, so he would move on to another project before completing the work. The main excitement for Leonardo was not creating the art, but the process of envisioning it due to his intellectual curiosity in the field of science. Leonardo once quoted, Study the science of art. Study the art of science. Develop your senses, especially learn how to see. Realize that everything connects to everything else. Leonardo broke the mold of how we view intellect. Though there were many artists and innovators in his time period, Leonardo stood out and excelled among both the artistic and scientific communities. Many claim him as the artist who epitomized the Renaissance era, and yet he was also valuable in developing and furthering technologies. He was the first Renaissance artist to study and practice industrial design, and even his artist artistic works were contributory. Through applying his genius in a way that only he could, he breached the borders of science and art and allowed his skills to serve. By using his artistic eye and utmost attention to detail, in collaboration with his keen interest in science, he was able to provide in a way that other researchers and inventors couldn't. For example, he created drawings depicting the human heart that were so detailed that even hundreds of years later they, were, they would be used to help revolutionize the way mitral valve surgeries are done. His artistic side enabled him to communicate his theories and his research findings in a way that others couldn't. His Vitruvian Man drawing, shown here, demonstrates how his art infuses his interest in anatomy and science. The painting illustrates several of his observations. The length of the man's wingspan is the same as his height, the length of his foot is one-sixth of his height, and the palm is the width of four fingers. This crossing of science and art leads us away from the thinking that one's mind must be specific to just one aspect or field of study. Leonardo's educational background is also very important. He was primarily trained as an artist, and in modern day that might not seem very valuable. But without having this background, he wouldn't have been able to create diagrams and anatomical drawings with the same amount of detail and accuracy. His scientific research was made more valuable because of his artistic training. His anatomy drawings expanded the way that science was looking at the human body. His drawings utilized exploded diagrams and cross sections which were groundbreaking in his time in terms of detail. Making these would not have been possible had he not had the background in arts. Another work that iterates this dual effort in both art and science was an aerial map he made for Cesar Borgia that is still accurate in today's times. During Leonardo's younger days, he sought employment under Ludovico, who was the Duke of Milan at that period. Ludovico was mainly concerned with his image, glory, and power. When Leonardo approached him, he tried to appeal to those senses and interests, which included warfare and his art, in order to show Ludovico's magnificence. Of course, Leonardo himself had other intentions. Therefore, Leonardo was mainly under Ludovico's employment to experiment and try out his many ideas and also tapping into his logical and intellectual side of the brain. The engineer within him, this logic, these ideas, also made Leonardo aroused and infatuated to the point that he researched many other fields. These fields include anatomy, astronomy, physics, optics, plate tectonics, geomatics, aerodynamics, architecture, solar energy, and many, many other fields. As his interests grew, his work ethic declined, and he was unable to meet deadlines of any projects that were pitched to Ludovico. As Ludovico's impatience increased, Leonardo's unease did as well. Leonardo was aware that if he does not persuade Ludovico, he could be unemployed, and thus not being able to continue researching his ever-expanding knowledge and ideas. With this in mind, Leonardo proposed a bronze horse that was 24 foot tall in order to capture Ludovico's image. A horse that size was never done before, and so it was a challenge that Leonardo was prepared to take on. And a great bait that was used to win Ludovico over. 
This horse, well, actually, this idea of a horse would buy Leonardo 16 years. 16 years that he mainly used to enlarge his own interests and ambitions while expanding his knowledge. During this 16-year period, Leonardo spent his time in his engineering, art, science, making war machines, working on aerodynamics, dissecting human bodies, finding the working anatomy and the organs such as heart, eyes, even the proportionality of every human part. Leonardo being the man that he was, he was not satisfied by simply just dissecting the eye, but rather he wanted to find what it is within the eye and how is it that we could see. Dissecting the human eye is not an easy task for anyone, even at this point right now. In order for Leonardo to make a perfect dissection of the eye, he had to dissect the eye in a way that the liquids in the eye would not be able to escape. In his words, first dissect the eye as a whole. Before making an incision, boil the eye with the white of an egg. After so, you should be able to cut through the eye without the possibility of the liquid escaping. With this perfect dissection of the eye, Leonardo was able to discover how the eye sees. This refuted the conventional method, which was believed that the eye sheds light onto objects, and that is why we see. But Leonardo rejected this idea, and believed that it is rather the objects that reflect light within our eyes, and that's why we are able to see. In his drawing, he also showed the detail of inverse imaging and how the optics work within the human body. Leonardo's analytical conception of the eye used the physical principles that were bound by the laws of engineering. These laws also allowed him to explore a higher grasp of his ingenuity. In the field of geology, he concluded that rivers not only erode rock, but also deposit rocks as well. Leonardo put his research into practicality when working under Cesare Borgia. Under Borgia, Leonardo actively worked in the field of war machinery, geography, topography, architecture. Overall, looking at the integrity and the depth of Leonardo's work and research, Leonardo da Vinci was without a doubt beyond his time. His mind was capable of absorbing the nature around him and processing it in a matter of simply asking why and how, then doing the work to find the answer to this question. Leonardo always tried to be proficient in anything he did. His proficiency was so vast that he even studied the science of civil engineering, in that he envisioned cities and roads that would coincide with one another. These plans are still now used during the modern era. Even Leonardo's work in aerodynamics and weaponry were proven to be technologically advanced in comparison to his time, and were later tested and rebuilt using his blueprints. These plans and envisions were proven to work. These experiments included his parachute, helicopter, and the earlier version of a tank. Many view Leonardo da Vinci as a great man, a man that was able to create something almost out of nothing, a man that was able to capture every image that he actually saw, every emotion. Maybe that's why it took him so long to ever finish one project. But many also view him as a tyrant. Building war machines, such as tanks, machine guns, cavalry that can easily take a man's foot off, was he a tyrant or was he a noble man? Was he a warmonger or an artist? One simple presentation cannot grasp the vast abyss that was Leonardo da Vinci. Many other ideas, each idea coincide with another, but we like to view Leonardo as a man he was, a revolutionary who put the specialists to shame.